By adding China to the WTO, we strengthen the organization. This step represents great progress for China, the WTO, and the world trading system. From Radio Free Europe, I'm Reid Standish, and this is Talking China in Eurasia. On today's episode, we're digging into how China has sharpened its most powerful weapon on the world stage, its economy. The pandemic might have pushed us to the forefront, but for decades, the Chinese Communist Party has been studying how to leverage its economy for geopolitical gain. We've seen it happen in Lithuania. This shipment of 20,000 bottles of Lithuanian rum was blocked from entering China. It's hit Australia. China began an anti-dumping probe in August, but in Canberra, the decision was viewed as part of a pattern of trade measures since Australia called for an inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. And it's even managed to influence some juggernauts of American culture, like Silicon Valley, Hollywood, and even the NBA. You know, we love China, we love you know, playing there. Uh, they show us the most important love, so uh, we love everything you know, they're about and, and, uh, and you know, we appreciate the support that they give us. But how did we get here? And perhaps most importantly, what does it mean for the world? Helping me understand this is Bethany Allen. She's an American journalist based in Taiwan for Axios. And she's the author of the new book, Beijing Rules, how China weaponized its economy to confront the world. Hey, Bethany, welcome. Thanks a lot for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm great, and it's great to be here, Reed. Great. Well, I'm really excited to get started with you. So I think before we really go any deeper, we're going to need to start by having you explain the fundamentals. In your book, you discuss how China has really honed and codified this thing that you call authoritarian economic statecraft. What do you mean by that exactly? And what does it mean for countries and companies around the world? Well, a term that uh, we also talk about more now is economic coercion, which is maybe a little bit more easy to understand. But ec authoritarian economic statecraft is the way that China both uses economic carrots and sticks to shape the behavior of states, companies, individuals, and multilateral institutions to bring that behavior in line with the Chinese Communist Party's core interests. And I, I add authoritarian there because the way that China uses this kind of economic statecraft is to pursue illiberal interests or also its own narrow geopolitical interests rather than multilateral interests or you know, democratic or liberal ones. So, so, I mean, I think what you're describing here, Bethany, is something that most people and certainly most Western governments, they'd find fairly concerning. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, how did the Communist Party go about achieving something like this? Well, the first big time, the, the first time that we really saw the Chinese Communist Party use this kind of power in a big way was about 25 years ago uh, in 1997, when there were two Hollywood movies that both portrayed Tibet in a positive light. You have to leave Tibet, Quentin. Your life is a great risk. I made arrangements to get you out. How can I help people if I run away from them? One of them was Seven Years in Tibet with Brad Pitt, and one of them was Quindoin, which was a Disney movie about the life of the Dalai Lama. If you stay in Tibet, we cannot guarantee your safety, Holiness. If you flee, you might never be able to return. And the Chinese government uh, blocked Disney's Mulan from playing in China for months afterwards and also based more or less banned the um, the studio that had made Seven Years in Tibet for years afterward from, from showing any movies in the Chinese box office. And boy, was that effective because since 1997 up to the present day, there has been no major Hollywood movie that has cast the Chinese government as the bad guy, cast the Chinese military as the bad guy. Um, you know, there's been no more major movies about Tibet. That was a lesson that, that Hollywood learned really, really well. And that's pretty stunning because in 1997, the Chinese economy was far smaller than it is now. It, that China hadn't even joined the WTO. It didn't have the kind of access to the global economy that it does now. But already, companies were so eager to get into the Chinese market and they saw such potential there that they felt they, they had to do 
whatever the Chinese government wanted them to do to be able to get in. So is is this something that the Chinese government sort of, you know, is, is this a really deliberate policy that was followed? Or is it just more something that was, you know, learned through trial and error over the years? Oh, it's very deliberate. Um, and, you know, we've seen more and more and more examples of it. And And it's not just about speech or you know, Hollywood movies or tweets. This also is directed at, you know, the the most basic behavior of states, which is national security. So if you look uh, in the, the mid uh, 2010s, around 2016, South Korea agreed to deploy a, a U.S. missile defense system called THAAD. U.S. launchers and other equipment for a controversial missile defense system have arrived in South Korea. China and Russia are both angry as the U.S. plans to deploy the terminal high-altitude area defense system within the year. Well, another feature of this behavior is that it isn't de jour. And so a lot of times what, what we see are the results of it, but there's no official statement from the Chinese government saying that this happened. So in the case of South Korea, um, Chinese tourists just somehow stopped going to South Korea. There, there was a sort of state fan consumer boycott. Chinese tourists have virtually disappeared in the last month. Beijing has not acknowledged imposing a tourist ban, but travel agencies in Seoul have been told by their partners in Beijing that tours have been canceled due to pressure from the China National Tourism Administration. There is no document to prove this, but clearly it is understood that China is making such suggestions. So it's this kind of de facto, unspoken, very opaque uh, way of, of punishing a government and even a society for doing something that the Chinese government didn't like. In this case, you know, this uh, missile defense system was intended to defend against uh, North Korean missiles, but it also in theory, could be used to defense against Chinese missiles. And this was something that the Chinese government felt they couldn't accept. Right. Well, I'm always, you know, it's something I find so fascinating about this story, you know, this idea of how China's, you know, weaponized its market. Um, But, you know, a big part of this, you know, I think as you alluded to a little earlier, is, you know, the West, especially the U.S., they've played this huge role in enabling China's economic rise. The question is not whether we approve or disapprove of China's practices. The question is, What's the smartest thing to do to improve these practices? Further development of China's trading relationships with the United States and other industrial countries will work to strengthen the rule of law within China and to firm its commitment to economic reform. Walk me through that process, Bethany, of, you know, how do we get from this moment, you know, the the Soviet Union is on its last legs or collapsing. Uh, it's this really interesting sort of period here in the 1990s. There's this feeling of, you know, a triumphalism within the West about what you know markets can can accomplish. And then there's really this big process about bringing China in. So how do we get from there to now? And how did China use that to sharpen this economic weapon we're talking about? Yeah, well, in the 90s, as you said, um, you know, with the fall of the Soviet Union, there was this incredible optimism. There was a belief in shock therapy, which was, uh, you know, a lot of U.S. and Western um, economic reformers helped coach post-Soviet economies for this, you know, kind of sudden method of transition from a centrally planned economy to a to a market economy. And in China, you know, they they had a, a failed, uh, you know, a failed transition to democracy with Tiananmen. And in the 90s, kind of as a social contract, you know, Deng Xiaoping more or less said, look, you know, you don't question our political model, but we'll give you economic reforms and economic prosperity. And so he launched into a pretty rigorous decade of uh, economic reform and opening. Deng Xiaoping radically shifted China's economy. Its four decade long economic boom was built on embracing capitalism and encouraging private business. Special economic zones, um, as pilot projects for you know for foreign partnerships and investment, they really opened the gates of foreign investment, letting you know companies from all over the world come in, joint ventures. Um, you know, Chinese companies started going out into the rest of the world you know, to pursue trade, and so you see China's economy not just growing at an extremely rapid rate, but also integrating uh, with the rest of the world's economy. 
But China did some things differently. So it, it, it never adopted shock therapy. It never had, you know, this sudden abolition of price controls, complete privatization. In retrospect, that was great because it prevented China's economy from falling into this kind of doldrums that happened, um, you know, across the, the post-Soviet nations. But what, what did happen was that China, the Chinese government never really relinquished control in some ways over, over many parts of the economy. So what we've seen in the last 10 years, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, is more and more of these kind of gates put on China's economy. They can hold the gates open as much as they, as they want, but they can slam them shut at any moment if they need to. And there's a number of different ways that the Chinese government can do that. You know, various bureaucratic licenses and approvals that are needed, they can just not give those approvals. They do that through party influence and control over individual Chinese companies. There's Chinese Communist Party cells that are integrated in the top leadership of companies. They do that through state fanned nationalist boycotts, as we've seen against Western companies when they do something that crosses a Chinese Communist Party red line, um, total control of the customs system at the borders, literally letting boats full of Norwegian salmon rot in port after the Nobel Peace Prize Committee um, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese lawyer and dissident Liu Xiaobo um, in 2010. The Nobel Peace Prize in 2010 has been awarded to prominent Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo, now in jail for subversion. We regret that the laureate is not present. He is in isolation in a prison in northeast China. Nor can the laureate's wife, Liu Xia, or his closest relatives be with us. China's foreign ministry spokeswoman said China won't stop or change because of interference from what she called some anti-China clowns. When you're talking about this, these are all these examples of China really harnessing, you know, its economy, uh, you know, to, to achieve its, its, its wider sort of foreign policy ambitions. But of course, I mean, China isn't the only country that does this in the world. I mean, I think probably best well known as the United States, you know, it wields tremendous power globally through its currency and the use of sanctions. You know, you've seen it hit Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, uh, Cuba for, for many years. Um, so how is what you're describing for China different than that? Or is it? Absolutely. So, you know, economic statecraft as a term has in the past been used more to describe sanctions, these kinds of de jour um, mechanisms that you're talking about. And of course, the U.S. has the advantage of dominance of the international financial system. The U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. And the U.S. has used sanctions extensively. But there are two main differences with how the U.S. employs sanctions and with how China uses these sort of de facto and informal sanctions. The first is that the U.S. almost almost exclusively, uses sanctions to achieve multilateral goals. So, for example, nuclear nonproliferation, combating terrorist financing, upholding the integrity of the international financial system through fighting money laundering, uh, and to punish gross human rights violators. Now, there are exceptions to this. And we saw some of those, for example, during the Trump administration, when the Trump administration levied sanctions on two international criminal court investigators who were investigating potential U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. Now, after the Biden administration came in, they lifted those sanctions because they were very clearly against how the U.S. has previously used sanctions. So it's you know not 100% to pursue multilateral goals, but overwhelmingly it is so. Also, U.S. sanctions have a high degree of political restraint. That means that the U.S. could theoretically use sanctions, no one could stop us really, to pursue narrow interests such as, I don't know, the CEO of a European company uh, you know, criticizes um, structural racism in U.S. society. It is theoretically possible that the U.S. could sanction that company, but we don't. China, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. So they use these controls over their economy only, exclusively, to pursue their own narrow geopolitical interests, usually around Taiwan, uh, Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and during the COVID pandemic, um, any scientific discussion of the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. 
the other difference is a, is a functional difference. So the U.S. is able to use financial sanctions and its sway over the international financial system and the international banking system so that U.S. financial sanctions as a formal instrument are very effective. The Chinese government doesn't have that. The, the renminbi is not a significant reserve currency. The Chinese government doesn't have sway over the international banking system. So they've had to be quite innovative and creative to find a different way to use economic or financial power to exert power extraterritorially, and this is how they do it. Okay, so some, some clear differences there. Um, you know, I, I think so far we, we've we focused on how we got here, what led to China being able to harness its economy as this dominant weapon. But what does that dominance look like in a place, you know, across Europe and across Eurasia? Sure. So, you know, China's authoritarian economic statecraft very roughly speaking, comes in two forms, carrots and sticks. Uh, The carrots are something that is a little bit harder to observe, but if your government or your company is willing to abide by, you know, our restrictions, then, you know, we will let you into our country and you can make a lot of money. And this is very well understood. And, And so as a result, you can, you, know, you can see this in the UK, you can see this in Germany, you can certainly see it in the US going as far back as the 90s. The business lobbies in these countries whose profits are so tied up or the promise of profits have become so tied up in the Chinese economy, they've almost become a pro-Beijing business lobby in their respective countries. So this is kind of a, a, a carrot approach. The stick approach is, is something that has become a lot more apparent in recent years. And I think an excellent example of this is Lithuania. So Lithuania uh, decided to allow Taiwan to open an an informal, unofficial representative's office in Vilnius uh, called the, you know, the the Taiwan representative office or something. And now there's, there's plenty of precedent for this. Lots of countries have this. The U.S. has this. It's called TECRO in D.C., the, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representatives Office. Now, the difference with Vilnius is that they allowed Taiwan to use the name of the country, Taiwan. But Lithuania has, doesn't have a lot of direct economic ties to China. Their, their economy is just not that tied up in China's economy. And I, I think that's likely one of sort of the prerequisites that Vilnius was even able to consider that. But anyway, so they did it. And that crossed a line for Beijing. So, you know, you're sitting in Beijing. You don't have these direct economic levers of influence over Lithuania that you do over many other countries. What do you do? And here's where it gets really interesting. Beijing pressed multinational businesses to sever ties with the country. That works not only in some cases for uh, goods that are produced in Lithuania, but also goods that include the components produced in Lithuania. And so then we saw German companies, you know, in a real pickle, their products started being held up at the border in China, you know, contracts being canceled. So they went to the German government to try to discuss this. And so there was pressure on Lithuania from German companies to change their policy. Okay, so so where did that leave, I mean, Lithuania then? And, and where did it leave the, the, the EU? I'm curious about the, 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 the response there. The EU says China's blockade of Lithuania over its stance on Taiwan threatens the foundations of the European single market. It's taken its case to the World Trade Organization. Does Beijing still have this big lever on Lithuania now? So Lithuania did not change its policy. In fact, they um, st- continued to strengthen ties with Taiwan. The effect of, of this in Europe was that it was, it was so brazen, it was so shocking, and it was over something so petty that it really got the attention of European governments. It really brought home, really for the first time in European capitals, how significant and serious of a challenge that China's economic coercion can be. Now, some people might argue that in this way, China's use of economic coercion in Lithuania backfired. But I would strongly uh, warn anyone from that kind of an interpretation because these kinds of cases are more like, there's a Chinese phrase, killing a chicken to scare a monkey. It's making an example of somebody. It creates a kind of deterrence for other countries. But it's very hard to quantify because we're talking about actions that were never taken or decisions that were never made. Were there other small countries in Europe that were considering, you know, strengthening ties with Taiwan or 
doing anything else that might upset Beijing. And then they decided not to because of that. It's very, very difficult to know. And that's why it's hard to measure the, you know, the effectiveness of China's authoritarian economic statecraft in any kind of numerical sense. You have to more look at the overall political debate across, you know, a whole continent to see if it's effective or not. Well, I, I mean, I think another example that comes to mind about this is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, you know, the sprawling Chinese foreign policy venture. It's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's all about investment and building infrastructure around the world. It's something that the Chinese launched back in 2013 officially. So how does Belt and Road fit into what you're talking about in your book? Yeah. So Belt and Road is a you know kind of development assistance and infrastructure building program, as you said. And that is a very traditional kind of economic statecraft. This is not really the Chinese being particularly innovative. It's more of them trying to catch up with the West. The Belt and Road Initiative has expanded China's footprint around the world. And the scope of Beijing's global influence has changed how the U.S., and its allies see China. Some of the- China's Belt and Road, again, carries some of these characteristics of China's influence in that it is often very opaque, that agreements with countries are secret. But what we have definitely seen, and again, you know, with this sense of you have to kind of look at the whole picture to get the, the sense of how much influence, how much geopolitical influence the Belt and Road would have, you know, I would draw one's attention to the United Nations. And so if you, for example, look at some of these really hot button issues for China, um, China's human rights violations in, in Xinjiang or its, its treatment of Hong Kong, there, uh, there's, it's almost a, a perfect look at what the, the BRI, the role that the BRI has for China. So for example, in 2020, there were uh, two competing letters that were submitted to the UN Human Rights Commission about China's authoritarian takeover of Hong Kong through its national security law. Uh, One letter was signed by a set of countries, mostly liberal democracies, but not entirely, expressing concern or condemning China's takeover of Hong Kong. None of those countries had had officially signed up to be part of the Belt and Road. Now, the competing letter, which had more countries sign, almost every single country had either formally signed an agreement to be part of the Belt and Road or had signed a, 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 an MOU in some fashion stating interest or involvement in the Belt and Road. A, a perfect example of how to, you know, the BRI can, can affect discussion uh, in the United Nations. Bethany, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. I think you've laid out your case pretty clearly. Um, But I think all of this leads to a really big question, especially as we're living in this moment where China is incredibly influential all across the world. So what does this tell us about how China will behave as a superpower in the years to come? What we've seen is that the Chinese Communist Party is able to very innovatively figure out how to get around some of the bulwarks of Western liberal-based organizations, institutions, and the world order at large. And that, they, that, the, that Beijing has been able to do that quite effectively in order to create, to shape the international system into one that is much friendlier to authoritarian principles. And we've seen an acceleration of that over the past three years during the COVID pandemic, when Xi Jinping seems to have determined that the West was you know, fully in decline and that China's time has come. Now, it's my opinion that he has underestimated the resilience of democracies. But what we have seen from China's leadership is an emphasis on shoring up their own economic resilience in the face of a, you know, an increasingly difficult global economic environment and global political environment. Uh, being able to be independent, um, self, self-sustaining self in terms of their own science and research, um, a dual circulation strategy to help their to help make their economy more resilient based purely on domestic factors in the face of international struggles. I think we are going to see more of this from China, not less. And I think that it, it's going to be a massive undertaking for liberal democracies to create the kinds of mechanisms and to honestly to absorb some of the economic uh, 
fallout that will happen to them from pursuing, um, you know, reshoring and a, a more democratic economic statecraft. Bethany, it's been so great to have you shed light on this. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Bethany's new book, Beijing Rules, is available online and in bookstores now. All right, that's all for this episode. I'm your host, Reed Standish. Studio direction was done by Andre Steiner. Katie Toth is our producer. Thanks to editors Carla Padrette, Kathleen Bohr, and Pete Baumgartner. And to Radio Free Europe's journalists around the world that make podcasts like this possible. If you like this podcast, please share it and subscribe to Apple, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen. Finally, if you haven't already, subscribe to the China and Eurasia newsletter, which goes out every other Wednesday. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.